we want to hear the stories from the courses that you've taught. Whether in a lab, a classroom, kitchen, on Zoom, or in a shop. Drawing on your expertise, we'll ask the probing questions. What goes right and what goes wrong when teaching your favorite lesson? Hello, everybody, and welcome back to My Favorite Lesson, a podcast hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College. I am Dr. Lauren Spring, and I am sitting here today with Adam Holland, who is a professor in the Construction Management Program within the School of Engineering and Information Technology. Hi, Adam. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for being here. And I know I said you were, you know, a professor in the Construction Management Program, but you also teach in other programs, too. Yes, correct. I'm, uh, I guess, a subject matter expert in a certain area, and I, I work within... Um, AFPM, which is Architecture Facilities Project Management. Um, sometimes they get into environmental building systems. Mm. Um, so yes, I move around the college in quite a few programs. Wonderful. So that gives you a good sense of kind of what's going on in this particular domain. Well, to be honest, I think I'm the lucky one. I get to meet all different lenses, different people, and different sort of approaches to sort of education, right? So being all those different um, programs, it really opens your eyes to a lot of different things. And how long have you been with the college? Uh, three and a half years. I'm coming up on four years old, so looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah. And um, so you found your footing, you know, you're <laughs> yeah, no, I was starting to run. Yeah. I was a practicing professional before in the, in the industry, and I, I've always wanted to be a professor. Um, but to be honest, I don't have a PhD. And so that sort of precludes me from teaching at a university. And then when I saw the opportunity here at Conestoga, I jumped all over it. And so what, what do you said you've always wanted to be a professor? What do you think it was about this, this area that, that was thrilling for you? Well, if I back up a bit, um, my wife is a professor um, for 27 years at Laurier. Okay. And sort of her whole family is huge into pedagogy. Um, and all of them have PhDs and they're all professors. So mm -hmm. when I married into that family, it really opened my eyes into teaching and pedagogy and just being the life of a professor. And to be honest, I've always been envious of her. Mm -hmm. um, that she had, she had the ability to take the time to work with students and listen. Mm -hmm. In my prior world as an architect and in a, a, a firm, it's all about billable hours and getting stuff done. So I really didn't have the luxury to stop and listen. Mm -hmm. And those kind and, of relationships that... Yeah, and I've always sort of looked afar and been envious of that. And again, when this opportunity presented itself after 30 years in the industry, I thought I can bring that sort of knowledge from the industry into the classroom. And again, that's why I jumped all over it. It was a great opportunity. Cool. And yeah, I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more because you, you mentioned you were, you know, a professional architect for a long time, also have a background in civil engineering and urban design mm -hmm. and planning. Can you let us know a little bit about sort of, yeah, your, your general background and, and how you're so well equipped to, to teach in all these different programs at the college? Oh, sure, sure. Um, yeah, I started off in civil engineering and it went well. I enjoyed it, but I just felt that you're only fulfilling a function. You didn't make anything really look good. Huh. And I used to say that to my professors, and they say, well, if you want to do that, go become an architect. So I did. <laughs> so then I left there, and I went to Guelph, uh, did landscape architecture and urban design for five years there. Uh, oh. It's a five-year program. Um, and then I went out into the industry. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a great experience, but I was more of a construction lens, um, project management, team leader, stuff like that, not necessarily doing a lot of the drawings, which I really enjoyed, mm -hmm. and the okay. designs. I got, I quickly elevated into a management role. And then that is good and bad. It's just very boardroom driven, I guess, environment wise. Mm. Right. And I sort of felt like I was stepping away from what my true love and passion was. So then when I had a chance to move towards um, being a leader for design and urban design projects, uh, specifically IBI group, um, we really changed a lot of landscapes around here. Do you have a, a kind of standout one, one that you're particularly proud of that you were involved in, in hmm. shifting the landscape of? Yeah, I'd actually, I'd probably pick, um, IBI was hired to design King Street. IBI is, what's that? IBI idea? Group, sorry. Um, they're a large architectural firm. Gotcha. Right. Okay. So we were hired to design King Street, right, from the ION all the way up. Ah. 
uh, towards the university. So we did that um, with multiple team, multifaceted disciplines of so engineering and all the other disciplines. And then the last part was obviously the urban design, which is what I was sort of prominent part, the part that everyone sees, right? The streetscape. Yeah. Um, and then I had another opportunity to present itself. I got to design and build that thematic lighting that's in Uptown Waterloo. Oh, really? Yeah. Ah, tell us a little bit more about that. Oof, I'm to think how I start thematic there. lighting. That might be a, a term that's new to some folks. What does that even mean, thematic lighting? These, those, are the, if you, if you've been to Uptown Waterloo, you'll see 66 stainless steel structures that are wrapped around the trees, the urban trees, and they're all lit and they're all connected and programmed. So we can literally do, you know, 16 million different colors. The only limit is your imagination. Or, and so now the city uses it as an opportunity to respect special days and special events and to celebrate them. Cool. Yeah, so it's pretty neat. Do you find, are you ever, ever able to sort of be in a place and just relax? Or are your, is your mind always sort of buzzing with like, oh, why did they put that there? Or, you know, this could be slightly shifted. And do you just see the world through that lens everywhere you go? Kind of, yeah. Um, it hopefully it doesn't bother other people, my family. <laughs> I honestly really enjoy watching other people because they tell the story. Where people sit, why they sit there, where they communicate, how they communicate. My goal is to create environments that people want to be in. Mm -hmm. Right. And the more I can find those opportunities that they can communicate, that sort of elevates the level of design because that's what you're after. Communication. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and would you say that that is becoming more or less of a priority? Right. Definitely. Now? More of a priority now? Well, I think COVID really hurt us all. Mm -hmm. Right. It really put us into a, a small box. Now that that's off. Urban design, everyone wants to be out, everyone wants to be together, and everyone wants to be around other people, right? Mm -hmm. So the more environments we can create for people, the more people will go to, right? And so that's sort of that balance is, of course, I understand there's monies and budgets involved, but creating spaces that people want to be in. Um, I'm curious, is there any particular architect that um, you really admire or any maybe mm. space that you've been in that you just think like, yeah, like this person got it. And I, I could spend all day here. I'm going to bring everyone I love <laughs> to see this place. Exactly. Um, no, that's a great question. Try to think for a second. I'd say one of them definitely would be Dan Wiley. Okay. Uh, he's a landscape architect and he designed Paley Park in New York. Okay. I don't know if anyone's aware of it. It's more or less this wee pocket park that's in the middle of two major 50 store towers side by mm. side. Okay. It's a little park right in the middle of like a very busy section of New York, um, has a waterfall at the back so that it muffles the sound of the cars, but it's simple. It has eight uh, locust trees that create a canopy so it's nice, it sort of covers the light so it's not so hot. And it has a, you know, a whole 50 or so or 75 white mobile chairs. Mobile chairs? Yep. It's, and everyone's always worried, well, they'll be stolen, they'll be damaged, things like that. Not one chair has ever been stolen. Not one chair has ever been damaged. Why they're so popular is because then people can move the chairs where they want, sit where they want, communicate how they want. That's so neat. I and don't know And it's so part. simple. And it sounds like a really small space too, right? It's, it's yeah, not it's not like... very large. And to be honest, that was a huge part that's always stuck with me, the simplicity of it mm -hmm. and creating, again, environment for people. You don't have to have some big, flashy, you know, Paris-type environment. You can do it very simplistically. It's just, it's the elements that make it, the elements that create pe make people feel comfortable. And again, if they're comfortable, they'll communicate and stay. That's so neat. Um, and now, you, you know, you've mentioned this word communication a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in, you know, hearing what you say too about the importance of pedagogy with, within your wife's profession and kind of your, your in-laws, do you find that this you know, this value of communication translates for you into the classroom and your relationship with students? Definitely. Um, I really want to take what I've done in practice or what I've experienced out there sort of in the real world and bring that into the classroom. And it's not always bringing the good into the classroom too. You know, sometimes it's also talking about the things that don't work. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm comfortable to say, here are the mistakes I made in my career, uh -huh. right? And here's what went wrong and why. So learn from them so that you don't make the same mistakes. So you could do that? You would like bring in some photos of a space you're not particularly proud of having designed or? <laughs> Potentially, but it's more, usually it comes down to the communication. And sometimes I'll talk about from a construction management perspective per se, right? Lines of communication that broke down. 
Right. And when those lines of communication break down, you get a substandard design or the project doesn't run well mm-hmm. or it isn't on budget. And there's a whole bunch of sort of, I guess, negative areas that could go towards. But a lot of that all stems to how well you're communicating. And again, are those visions of the owner transferred to the property and the design? And that's fascinating because I feel like there's so many players in you know, that go into designing a space, right? Like like you're saying, there's the owner, there's probably, you know, government regulations mm-hmm. given whatever place it might be. Yep. And then as the the manager, you probably have your own vision. Tell me a little bit about kind of how how that even works in construction management, how all these different voices are are heard or not or how that how that transpires. Well, that's a great question as well. I'm trying to think how do I answer that. Um, a lot of it is is bringing everybody together and making sure you listen to everybody. You'll find that when you listen to the team, there's usually a common thread or two or three. Hopefully, the more threads, obviously, the better, the more connectivity you can have. So when you celebrate those commonalities, then you have to find out how can you deliver that commonality that satisfies everyone. Not easy to do sometimes. Um, But when you do do it well, it's successful. And I yelled sort of look towards King Street. I know the city's uh, super excited about it, all the way up to the commissioners saying it's one of the most profitable, no, sorry, one of the most successful projects in the city's history because mm. um, it only costs $5 a day to run. Wow. That's it. And it's working in the ways that it was it was envisioned. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. So again, moving everyone towards a common goal, really establishing here are our core values um, and also setting up what are the priorities when you're making decisions as a team, mm. right? Everyone wants the Taj Mahal or the big grandiose, you know, the Eiffel Tower. We can't all afford it, but we can also, that doesn't mean we can't do anything properly either, right? So it's focusing on those little things. What can we do? How can we make impact and how can we affect change? But again, together as a group, listening to those core values and having commonalities. And are there courses within your programs um, specifically about communication? Definitely. These skills? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because I guess, you know, from the sounds of it, there are almost as important as, you know, being able to read drawings and, and walk out of these programs with uh, with clear design and technical skills. This, this is also a key part of the interactions. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's sort of when you're doing construction management, like to simplify it, sort of scope, schedule, budget. We have mm-hmm. three paradigms and we're trying to put them together. The goal is to have them all equal, but life doesn't work out that way, <laughs> right? So sometimes you have to figure out which one is second, first, second, and third, But then also you have to respect all three of them because they're all important. So Mm -hmm. schedule, the timing of it, how long is it going to take, et cetera, et cetera. Budget, right? Rather straightforward. You can't do much if you don't have a lot of money, right? Right. And so on any given project, you know, you have those three main components and then you figure out, okay, what what is the priority for this particular project at this particular time kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Neat. Um, And do students respond well to this, this kind of communication aspect of, of these courses they're part of? is, Or is this sort of a surprise to them that these are skills that they need to develop? I personally think it's a bit of a surprise. I think in the past, you know, they've come, we're a graduate program, so you have to have prior experience and knowledge to come into the program. Mm. Some people come from all different parts of the world. Some are into architecture, some are into civil engineering, some are in interior design, et cetera, et cetera, right? Wow. But when they come here, they're so used to their one sort of mono lens. Mm. And when we expose them to all the different areas, you see their eyes open up and then they realize that you're not running this race alone, (laughs) right? You're on a team. It's sort of like that four by 100 relay, yeah. right? And so now you have to work together and you can become successful if you work together, Mm. right? So you sort of use that analogy. The most dangerous thing of that race, right, is handing the baton. Absolutely. Yeah, especially if you, you know, you do have a vision and you're excited about it and then <laughs> there are other factors that come into play that might might shift that, right? Exactly. Competing interests. So when you're also doing, you know, large projects, I guess the ideal thing is that if you can align your vision with the owner's vision or with the city's vision, mm. it just allows more sophistication of a design and it you're all marching towards the same goal. Right. It's really helpful. Yeah. That's so neat. Well, and and the particular favorite lesson that you wanted to share with us today is one that I know developed quite recently, about a year ago, um, and was a bit of an adaptation of an existing lesson, correct? Mm -hmm. Can you share with us what... Okay, yeah. Um, I've been working with um, in the Architecture Facilities Project Management. It's a great opportunity, and I was teaching urban design. 
Okay. And it was last summer, actually, um, in the semester. We had a final project that was due, and the goal was to, I guess, write a paper about how to put a second smaller building on your property. Okay. Right? The assignment was good. It w- I just didn't feel that it was sort of, I guess, exciting enough at the time because at this time we were just coming out of COVID and we were really mm-hmm. trying to figure out how do we engage students again? How do we make life and learning fun or yeah. enjoyable? So I saw an opportunity to rewrite that assignment and turn it to let's get students design something that affects them. Okay. Right? Yeah, I imagine, I would imagine if, you know, this is kind of putting a granny suite or a small additional property on one's own property, many students might not own property, right, no, <laughs> within this no, exactly. region. Um, that's that's already a, a hard thing to do for working professionals. So I would imagine, yeah, that would be a bit of a stretch for them to to imagine designing something like that. Exactly. So the, the thought was, is that can we get them to design something for themselves? Mm. And then I thought about well, what affects that. And then I was also noticing our, you know, our campuses so that they're there. We, we just wanted to design more life onto campus. So that's sort of where the two dots connected. Why don't I get the urban design students to figure out how can we bring more of an urban design flair to our current campuses? Okay, I like that. I like that word, urban design flair. Well, <laughs> and yeah. is, and is this something that you've noticed? I mean, we're lucky at Conestoga; we're growing, and we mm-hmm. have so many campuses. Was it something that you sort of had this visceral experience going from campus to campus, feeling this kind of lack that that this this life, this spark, um, was not necessarily there in all in all places? Oh, exactly. Um, to be specific, when I was teaching that urban design course, it was it was held at Cambridge. Mm-hmm. Cambridge, you know, they have a gorgeous building. They have a lot of land, which is very nice, but it's not developed. So okay. they do have a lovely master plan, but it's not going to be realized for the next 20 years. Mm-hmm. So on the interim, there's a lot of missing components that make it sort of a, we call it a PCP class, meaning parking lot, class, parking lot. Mm-hmm. People are sort of just coming here, doing class and leaving. They weren't spending time on campus. They weren't utilizing all the facilities. And that's simply because there was no lack of life on campus. And that's so interesting, right? Because we do have, I mean, I'm thinking primarily of Dune, I suppose, where there there are events and mm-hmm. other campuses too, right? There's there's places and there's things to do. But what I'm hearing from you is if people aren't feeling comfortable in that space or like the, the architecture isn't inviting them to stay longer, Correct. then they won't. It's not necessarily the activities. There's also something about the design of the, the space. Exactly. And when I did my master's degree at University of Waterloo in urban planning and design, and I remember spending many time at lunch myself on campus. Mm-hmm. So I would go to the, you know, to the common areas, to the student areas, and I was just I fell in love with the place. Mm. It's busy. There was music. There's food. Um, a lot of people, were, all the students were there, free Wi-Fi. <laughs> there was connectivity. There was collegiality. And there was discussion and communication, right? And that's what we're after. I was astounded at how busy that building was constantly. Mm. And then when I come to some of our campuses, I see that whole thread is not as, it's not as I guess, established. Interesting. So we, it just shows how much work we have to do to grow, to get better, to make a better spot. And so you saw this as a bit of an opportunity too, not necessarily like, hey, you know, let's go to, you know, those in charge of construction at Conestoga. But you said, what if we think about this from the ground up a little bit? What if we start with students who are actually the ones experiencing this, these spaces? Exactly. So I, to your point, I took that final uh, paper, I guess, that was for the granny flat originally and tried to figure out how do we create a space for students, designed by students, built by students, Mm. right? And that was sort of the the mantra, the motto that we moved forward with. And then now these students were sort of tasked with, will you create an urban pocket park, small, in essence, sort of the same size as, say, the keg patio, yeah. Right. Everyone sort of can visualize that. Okay. But like we, were, that. we were trying to take that size of element and put it onto campus adjacent to our building so that, again, people could be outside, maybe having food, but still working, still communicating and enjoying the campus more. Cool. Yeah. And so I just want to be clear on these parameters. So they were, it's a small section. You weren't yeah. asking them to redesign the whole no, no. campus. Yeah. That would be a bit overwhelming. Um but a small outdoor section, yeah. size of a keg patio, mm-hmm. and and it was open from there. Kind of what would they what would they do? Well, the thought was is that first of all, Wi Fi definitely right. Extend the Wi Fi. Um, most importantly, it also it had to be AODA compliant. Mm. 
right? right? So that all the able bodies are able to access it and leave it safely in an environment. So we want to make sure we had that proper flooring. Then the thought was, let's get seating, umbrellas, and also thought about seating, it connects with food. So if we could maybe put this in close proximity to the cafeteria and maybe expand that connectivity to the cafeteria, now people could buy food and go outside and eat, spend the afternoon outside, right? Do some work, talk with your friends, maybe do a group project, whatever. But that that place was there to go to, right? And so were students doing this in small groups, I suppose? Yes, we put them in teams of four and five. Okay. Right, and I sort of said to them, I said, you know, use the old analogy, there's two bars. Hmm. One has a huge lineup, one doesn't. Which one are you going to go to? Okay. Right? (laughs) Yeah. Exactly. So that was the thought I said to them. When you're designing these urban parks, create a space that you would want to go to yourself. Hmm. What are you looking for? What makes you comfortable? Because I'm quite sure if you're happy, a lot of other people will be happy with it as well. And now, were you surprised by anything that students came up with What that they said would make them happy that maybe you wouldn't have imagined? A lot of it, I think, was, well, first of all, the, the submissions, I my jaw just dropped. I was in awe. Oh, yeah. Um, they just, they dug deep. They spent a lot of time on it. They got into Revit. They were doing 3D visualizations and walkthroughs. Um, they wow. really put the time into this, much more than I ever anticipated. Oh, cool. So I think they took ownership of it. And they felt that if I'm going to create a spot for myself, I'm going to spend the time doing it properly. And they did, mm. which was really, really neat. I like that word ownership. Right? Mm-hmm. That, that, And I would imagine, I mean, and a lot of the students we have at Conestoga didn't necessarily grow up in this particular region, right? No, and so exactly. already coming here from outside of the province, outside of the country in some cases, um, they may not innately have that, right? That that kind of sense of ownership over a certain place that you do have if you've you know been born and raised in a certain area. So I wonder if that came into play a little bit too. Definitely. Anything that... I can engage the students and let them look at that the work you're doing will be valuable and you're going to change tomorrow and help them become better. So they they gravitate towards that because, again, it's much more important. It's real. It's not just fictitious. And when they, so when they completed these small group assignments, was there a presentation component or did they just hand it in to you? Like, did their peers get to see what they had created? Um, yes, actually. Um, they obviously had, they had to do a 10 minute presentation to the whole class, but I went a step further that I invited some of our senior management to have them come and sit and listen. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I was very pleased to see that um, we had uh, our executive dean, Tony Toma. Okay. We also had the vice president, Nelson, from CSI, the uh, Constable. Students Incorporated. Wow. Right. Um, and then Mitch uh, Wozniak, he is the uh, chair of engineering. Cool. So I, I'm thankful that the three of them uh, showed up. And when they did, they were the same as me. They were just astounded at the results. Wow. And they were very pleased. So to the point where as soon as it was over afterwards, they wanted to say, Adam, this is a great idea. We should spend more time on this and expand this. Well, and that's something that I, I want to get to now. So this is kind of a, you know, you had seen this project that was sort of pre-existing in the course, maybe not particularly inspiring for students, especially after the pandemic, um, when, you know, we were craving this sort of connection. You adapt the assignment, you invite these other folks to sit in, and now the project has expanded beyond this course, right? Yes, Ashley, um, knock on wood, thankful <laughs> for everything. Um the executives all the way up really saw the value in this opportunity. Um, and so what they said is we want to continue this. So I guess if I may, there was a grant that came out a little not too long ago, a okay. synergy grant, mm-hmm. right? So I applied for that with this urban park program, thinking this would be a great opportunity to maybe get started. Okay. I was unfortunately declined and I was kind of saddened. Mm. But then thankfully, Tony had a meeting with me right after to say, no, Adam, the idea is wonderful. It's just not going to work with the energy grant. But we want to continue it and we'll have other sources of funding that we'll try to find. So very supportive, um, really, you know, put a smile back on my face Mm because I thought this was a great opportunity. And the fact that senior management and all the other chairs or people I communicated with, they're all supportive. Um, usually when you do large initiatives, there's always a few naysayers or those that don't believe in it, right? Knock on wood again, I've not come across that those people yet. Everyone is supportive of it. So it's lovely. Oh. 
And pretty special, too, to have the Conestoga Students Incorporated, too, involved, right? Mm-hmm. Who, who are, you know, they're really, they really represent students well within the institution. And to have their voice at the table, too, alongside senior management is, is a pretty unique thing, I think. Exactly. If we can connect the students and their membership with senior management at the college, I think both people can talk together. You know, I sort of said when I gave a presentation to a, another group earlier, I said, We've all grown up in essence, I said, but we're still kids inside, Mm. right? I think we all kind of forget what it's like to be 20 years old again, 21 years old or 19, right? You're single, you're looking, you're trying to find a footing in life, uh, potentially meet your life partner, um, really trying to find long-term friends, right? But you need an environment to do that. Yeah. And that's sort of how all this comes together in a full circle. That's so neat. And so do you find, or do you imagine moving forward, I suppose, the next time you teach this course, will you adapt the assignment at all? Um, You know, will students be asked to focus maybe on a different campus or something so we could get more designs for, (laughs) you know, the general general college in general? Mm. No, great question. Um, To your point, I'm actually meeting with facilities and senior management in a week, week and a half. And we're going to sort of set the roadmap and the timing of things So how I'm going to handle this summer for teaching the urban design students, I'm going to have them focus on a section of the park. Maybe I'll Mm -hmm. have them focus on the flooring. And this allows us to get our footing with management to figure out the timing, to figure out the deliverables, and get that sort of whole recipe put together. Um, So yeah, so this summer students will be developing maybe more of the site furniture or maybe more of the flooring or how do we deal with all the IT and the Wi-Fi and... So things like that, right? And when you say site furniture, this is like outdoor furniture? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So, you know, nice umbrellas, nice patios, um, you know, seating areas, maybe some lounge chairs, huh. hammocks. We're, we're trying to keep it loose and out there, right? And I suppose, I mean, you described how there were folks kind of coming from interior design and architecture and engineering, all these different mm-hmm. backgrounds. seems to me like an assignment like this, a project like this, brings together all those components, right? Because they're not just saying, oh, we'll have chairs here, but they're, are they also involved in designing what kind of chairs and mm-hmm. how far do they lean back? And, you know, are they going to be mobile like those ones in that New York park you described? Excellent. No, that was the thought is once we started designing this urban park program, we realized the connectivity to so many different programs. And to your point, we can bring, incorporate urban design. We mm-hmm. can bring in interior design. We can bring in engineering, IT, communications, right? Marketing, uh, wow. social services, um, social media. So there's all these different programs now that can become involved in it or our departments. And then on top of it, we've gone one step further. We looked at all of our, our wonderful trades opportunities, right? If we need these things built, why couldn't I take those monies, go over to the trades departments and say, would you be willing to help us? Would you be willing to build these prototypes? Yeah, absolutely. Right. right? They've got yeah. <laughs> student assignments too that could be more relevant. Exactly. And then so they saw the opportunity, senior management, is that, hey, we could have them building what other departments are designing. And now again, we're connecting, we're cross-platforming, and we're pulling everybody together as one. So mm. it's... That's what we need to work out right now is all those logistics. How do we get things designed and what is the timing of that so that we can give it to trades so that they can build it to have it ready so that we can utilize, right? And getting all of those sort of moving parts together, that's the challenge right now for us. I bet, yeah. And do you find within this particular assignment, um, was there one or two things that students seemed to struggle with or that maybe you know, they didn't anticipate going into it, whether it's working together in that collaborative process or whether it was more something related to, you know, like you're saying, the AODA, Mm -hmm. Act for Ontarians with Disabilities, and making sure that that spaces are inclusive and accessible. Yeah, was there, was there some, what kind of questions did you have while students were working on this? What what were they struggling with? I think the students moved successfully with the urban design project. When it came to more logistics about, I told them, I said, this has to be removable. Hmm. And you're like, oh. <laughs> so now we don't have proper foundations and things like that. So whatever, because we have winter coming, right? Yeah. And the snow. So we need to be able to more or less put this away for the winter. Mm. Facilities need to make sure that everything's plowed and maintained and they have a tough job to do. So whatever we did do, we had to figure out how can you build it so that we can, in essence, again, put it away for the winter. That's so interesting too, right? Especially I would imagine if we have international students from countries that maybe don't have winter like we do here. um, And that's a whole other factor, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, 
it doesn't, it's not, you know, a consideration in many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. We also, when saying not just put away for the winter, the also thought was then, could we also find a way that we could make winter more enjoyable? Yeah. In that same space, how do you transform it to... Winter activity somehow, right? I know we can't heat the space because mm -hmm. that would just not be effective, but <laughs> finding some way to have winter events of some kind. I know up in Ottawa, right? And there's the winter carnivals and there's a lot going on in Montreal. And how do we bring some of those wonderful activities closer to here? Mm, I'd it's, love to see those designs. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we're, it's, a spy, it's an aspiration down the road. But yeah, if we can really bring that winter, I think that will be the final home run. So That's neat. the challenge. Wow. Um, so f I'm conscious of our time here, Adam, yep. and just to wrap up our discussion, I wanted to ask you if there's anything, you know, that maybe your colleagues and your students don't know about you that you'd like to share with the wider world right now, some mm. kind of, I don't know, leisure activities that you like to be engaged in or yeah, outside of, outside of Conestoga, what do you do? Huh, let me think about that. Um, <laughs> well, uh, since I'm in construction, I'm constantly ripping my house apart and either changing this or changing that, maybe to the detriment of my family. Um, oh, nice. I'm an avid sailor. Uh, I sail catamarans in the summer. Oh. Um, yeah, so it keeps me out of trouble a little bit. Where do you like to sail? Uh, up on Lake Huron. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, it's, the, the waves are, are, are big and Lake Huron is alive, so it's really engaging. It's not just simple flat water sailing. Wow. Um, my only my only sailing experience so far has been in the Pacific near Tahiti. And that was <gasps> not oh, that wow. was intense. I didn't really I mean, I, I say I was sailing. I was more underneath kind of throwing up and <laughs> 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 changed my relationship with the sea. That's for sure. Um, do you, are you kind of a solo sailor or do you prefer to do it with other people? Um, uh, it's an 18 foot catamaran, so I can sail it alone. I'm always hoping my daughters will join me mm -hmm. and my wife, but they do once in a while. But traditionally, um, we have a, there's a handful of us that keep all of our boats together and we kind of all sail together. So it's a lot of fun actually. Right. Neat. And with your renovation projects, is there a particular part of your house that you're most inclined to tear apart and, <laughs> and reconstruct? Or um, is it general? There's always another project. It's general. It's always on another project. The last thing I just did is I redid my daughter's, um, their bathrooms. Oh. And then they redid the showers and the tile and stuff. So now it's more of a walk-in shower. And so, yeah. Cool. Keeps me busy. Well, if you ever want to come to my house, take a look. I'm sure there's <laughs> lots of things that, that we could change to. Well, thank you, Adam. That was a really neat conversation. Uh, I so appreciate you being here and sharing your time with us. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we have come to the end of another episode of My Favorite Lesson, a podcast hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College. You can find all episodes in this series and more by following Teaching and Learning at Conestoga on YouTube. You can also find this podcast on Spotify and other places you get your podcasts. If you subscribe, you'll be notified each time a new episode becomes available. For 24-7 support for all things teaching and learning related, please check out our Faculty Learning Hub at tlconestoga.ca. I'm Dr. Lauren Spring, reminding you, as the great Bell Hooks once said, that the classroom, with all its limitations, remains a location of possibility. Until next time.